Hi, I'm Olivia, the Witch of Wonderlust here on YouTube and on Instagram. Um, I've got a wonderful guest for you today. She is somebody that I've followed for a couple years now. She's an author of a handful of books, including Inner Witch, A Modern Guide to the Ancient Craft, Bewitching the Elements, A Guide to Empowering Yourself Through the Earth, Air, Fire, Water, and Spirit, and Embody Your Magic, A Guided Journal for the Modern Witch. Not to mention, she does mention that she is working on yet another book. I have the absolute joy of talking today with Gabriella Herstick. On top of her books, Gabriella also has written for publications. Of course, as always, I'm going to leave all of her links and everywhere that you can find Gabriella and her work down below in the description. And with that said, let's go ahead and meet Gabriella. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your day to let me ask you questions and pick your brain. Yay, thanks for thinking of me. This is like my favorite thing to talk about. So I was very excited oh, when I got your request. So we'll just get started then. Awesome. All right, I, I just need the origin story. So like, where did, where did all it start? Where did you start practicing? And then how did that turn into what you do now? Yeah, good question. So I have always been an Aquarius child, a crystal child. Since I was little, I have felt very connected to nature, like was that little toddler talking to God and saying weird things to my parents. Um, I was raised Jewish. My, I'm as Jewish as you can get pretty much, but my mom has always been very spiritual and um, meditating and working with crystals and breath work and past lives since before it was like a, a thing to do. Um, and my dad is a rabbi in the reform sect of Judaism. So combined, both of them kind of influenced me to be interested in the unseen realms. My mom fostering that kind of spiritual aspect while my dad really gave me space to ask questions about God and death and religion and all that kind of stuff. But I really mark my beginning um, journey with witchcraft when I was in sixth grade. I was probably like 11, about to be 12, and I received a deck of fairy oracle cards by Brian Fraud, who's an amazing artist. Um, and I still have the deck on my shelf. Um, and I just you know, it was one of those things where something clicked and I had these incredible cards with all of these different beings on them and was like, I need to know about fairies. I need to know about what they are and um, ended up getting a book called A Witch's Guide to Fairy Folk by Eden McCoy and started to learn about witchcraft and paganism. And um, actually what ha happened was when I was around nine years old or I was nine years old, I was in third grade. I had gone to Salem, Massachusetts for my aunt's birthday. Her birthday's on Halloween. And That's I went with, so cool. I know it's <laughs> fun. I went um, with my twin sister and then my aunt, and my grandma, and we went to Salem and I spent Halloween there and went to Lori Cabot's store and saw a ritual and ate pomegranates. And I had this moment where I had already been kind of like really into the Salem witch trials. Like I was really fascinated with that at a really young age. And we went to the Salem Witchcraft Museum and I remember standing in front of this wax figure and having them tell me about Wicca and witchcraft and like reciting the rule of three in the Wiccan read. And it really impacted me. It was one of those things where I was like, oh my God, I don't really know what this is, but it feels relevant, it feels important. And then a few years later, when I was starting to do my own research about witchcraft, um, all the kind of, all these little threads connected. Um, so I did what a lot of us did. And I spent like every waking moment that I could at the occult and witchcraft section of my local like borders and Barnes and Noble, like staked out reading and going on the internet and like researching. And uh, at the time I did identify as Wiccan, which I no longer identify as, but I do, I do identify as neo-pagan witch. Um, and yeah, that like kind of started me on my journey. And then I um, wanted to be, or my background with school and work is fashion writing. So I had a fashion blog for a long time and I was always pretty open about my practice with witchcraft. Um, I grew up in the Bible Belt and yeah, my mom is from the Jewish community um, in Mexico City and my dad's a rabbi. So it was a weird intersection. Um, I already kind of felt othered a little bit just because, you know, it's in the land of mega churches and purity rings and was a Mexican Jewish at the age of 12. Um, but I, I just knew that it was something that it felt like coming home, witchcraft. It was just this kind of like recognition at a soul level that I still haven't really had since then. Um, 
And I started writing about witchcraft on my blog when I was in early college. I was kind of open about it in, in high school, but as you can imagine in the deep South, there's not as many uh, open witches as <laughs> there are places like where I live in LA right now. Um, but I started writing about it and I eventually started writing about witchcraft on platforms like Broadly and which was Vice's feminist platform and places like the Numinous and the Hood Witch. Um, and it ended up turning into my career, but I have always been a witch. Um, my practice is also super rooted in working with goddesses and the divine feminine. Um, that is, That has been woven into my witchcraft since I started practicing, really. Um, and because glamour and fashion have always been very important to me, um, self-expression is like one of the cornerstones, both of my practice and my life and my work. Um, it felt kind of like a natural progression to explore that as part of my practice with magic. But it really wasn't until I was in college. Um, I did a series of like nine blog posts. Um, each one was like a blog post inspired by a different tarot card. And I wore an outfit of, inspired by the card and like took photos with it and wrote oh, about that's it. Fun. It was really fun. The, the, my fashion blog doesn't exist anymore, but I have some of the photos and um, I did the hermit and the high priestess and the moon. And it was really cool because the photographer I worked with was this like sweet angel named Mary and she was Christian, like super Christian. But um, we were able to create this really beautiful art and she was always very accepting and receptive of who I was in my work, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was really the first time I recognized that glamour could be a part of my magical practice. And then when I moved to LA four and a half years ago, um, I started working with the goddess Venus who's behind me. And I realized that both my exploration of my sexuality, I had began, I had been practicing sex magic for a couple of years at that point, but not super intentionally. Um, I, I had this moment where I realized like my my love of glamour and self-expression and sexuality and sexual expression um, could all be part of a magical practice in devotion to Venus. So that was really when I kind of started exploring all of these aspects more seriously. Um, and it's really only in the past two or three years that it's kind of become this really interesting, subversive, like uh, acclimation of all of the different aspects of what's important to me. Um, I'm very, very Aquarius. I have my son, Venus and Mars in Aquarius. So like doing what um, feels right for me and what is like an authentic representation of my beliefs and expressing that is very integral to my magic. So what you see is what you get. I don't, obviously none of us share everything, um, but like I, I, I am who I say I am for the most part. And a lot of my, um, Visual imagery is part of that kind of devotion to Venus because I, she loves to be adored and she loves to be adored pu publicly. So I just <laughs> I do it beautiful. for her. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you're. I think I was first introduced to you uh, through your Instagram, and wow, like your Instagram feed is very curated. <laughs> like you know, it's it's very very unique. And so like the second I saw it, I was like, oh yeah, this is this is my shit. So I, you know, I followed. I was like, this is amazing. And you are really authentic about it you know like you can tell when somebody is trying to come off as a certain way or kind of like prove something um i think a lot of a lot of the time you can get people who aren't even in the really the witchy world is they're trying to prove like how how sexual of a being they are and you are very upfront about how sexual of a being you are but you're not you're not trying to prove it, you know? And I, yeah. I think that that's why uh, a lot of your platforms are so comfortable in that way. Mm -hmm. And like why a lot of people gravitate towards your work and your writing because you are just experiencing it. You're not trying to prove it or like put it down anybody's throats. It's just very like, this is what I've learned and what I've experienced and hopefully sharing this will help. So I appreciate that Thank about your you. work. Thank you for um, that compliment. I appreciate yeah, that of course. a lot. What led you into using your practice, your spirituality into sexuality and into glamour? What, I mean, you already said that, you know, you love fashion and glamour, but w was there a point that you were like, oh my God, I can put these two together or I have been putting these two together and then you curated it to be a little more concentrated? Oh, good question. Um, and yeah, I appreciate that insight. And I do want to say that like a lot of like my sexuality and sexual expression is like for me, which I think is like important to share. Like I, you know, 
right now I don't fucking have a sex life because of this panorama but like yeah. that part of my <laughs> that part of my practice is I, I that has been a, a really big part of it of um being devoted to myself and to the goddess within me the goddess outside of me as Venus as the goddess I'm devoted to um and not necessarily having my sexuality be something contingent on partners or who I'm seeing. So um, I don't, I don't try to force it. And I do, you know, I still, there's still ups and downs with um, how comfortable I feel expressing that part of myself. But um, I, so when I moved to LA and I started working with Venus, this was four and a half years ago, I started a series of of art, I would say called Love Letters to Venus, which I would take like these portraits of myself. I call them selfie portraits because I took all of them on my phone um, of like my body in lingerie and I'd put flowers in it and I would just like pose. I've always really loved modeling. Um, again, I had a fashion blog, which was like, if you were around in like 2008 to 2009, you remember the rise of the, the blogs and like, I just, you know, I, I like, I, I'm the exhibitionist. I like being watched and seen and, um, I like knowing that and then having a platform like Instagram where I could curate that for myself and share it. Um, I decided to do the series where I would, you know, dress up in lingerie and then I would write a channeled poem um, that I felt was coming from Venus. It was both like, it was almost like a feedback loop, like where I would connect with her and then like she would both share this poem with me, but it was also a devotional tool. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that for a while and like, you know, made it into like a little PDF that I put on my website or whatever, but that was really the first time where I realized that my sexuality and my sexual expression and my expression of self were all tools of like embodiment of this divine feminine aspect within me. Um, and also tools of devotion that I could share as an offering to the goddesses that I work with and with Venus in particular. Um, I like had this kind of aha moment earlier in quarantine, sometime, time's not real. So who knows if it was a month, three months ago, but I realized all of the different things that I really love. Um, I grew up doing ballet and I love dancing and um, obviously like glamour is really important to me. I love to be in nature. Like um, I love to write poetry and to write and like all of the different things that have felt very important in my life, I realized feel like the underlying thread with them was that they connected me to goddess and that they helped me like embody that energy and like be in that kind of like expansive creative just like state of being that helps me both be in relationship with her and be as her and when I realized that I think I was like okay like that's why like I love glamour because like I get to see myself as something like I get to see dressing myself and adorning myself as an act of of care and of love um, and of like sovereignty because I'm I'm choosing how I'm seen and I'm choosing how I'm looked at. Um, so it, the the fashion thing really like that started pretty close to when I started when I started identifying as a witch. Um, in middle school, I like was like, oh, I want to be a fashion writer, and then I just went to college for it. Like it just stuck. Uh, big fixed sign energy. Um, and then with, with sexuality, more specifically, besides Venus, it was really when I was first um, ex exploring kink and BDSM. And that was about three and a half years ago, four years ago. Um, and that just kind of naturally wove itself both into my self-expression, like you can see I'm wearing a collar, um, silver for Venus and also just like how I approached seeing myself as both uh, embodiment of goddess and like as um, giving myself the kind of experiences and love I wanted to get to get from somebody else and like incorporating being my own lover into like a magical ritual environment. So it's really been like the past couple of years that I've started to figure out how all these aspects of my work and my heart and my devotion fit together but it's been a really really fun journey that's awesome thank you <laughs> um i i'm curious you said you started exploring kink and bdsm about three and a half years ago have you taken any classes with justine cross or Ooh, i haven't but uh, i really like her i follow her on on twitter and instagram and all that stuff my cat is like knocking at the door. <laughs> uh yeah so i haven't taken any classes with justine herself well, her partner, Shane, um, I've taken a couple classes with them. Awesome. They're both wonderful. Um, yeah, she's so, really cool. 
yeah, so I follow them on on Instagram and Twitter as well. But I was just curious since you're based in LA. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't know if you've ever been to like the West or East dungeons. I haven't. I've been to a lot of the other ones in LA, but Dungeon East and Dungeon West are like two on my list still. And I've been wanting to take their the West classes. One. The nice. West one is really cool. That's is that the I'm one that's about. black or white? I think, I think they... it's the black one. Okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. love it. Was, like it was that. really fun. Um, my friend Carlos... For those of you who uh, are some OGs, Carlos was on my channel a long time ago, but my friend Carlos took me there and yeah, that was that was a whole new world. It was wonderful. You said something, glamour is kind of, the way that you des- defined it was glamour, you got to choose the way you're being perceived. You got to choose mm-hmm. the way that you're being seen. Is that how you would define like a glamour or like a, a magical glamour? When you talk about magical glamours, a lot of the time people think either A, on one side of the spectrum, the craft where she just changes blonde. Or B, it's like, oh, it's just color magic where, you know, I'm wearing red, so I'm, I'm a little more uh, you know, attention drawing today. Mm-hmm. Or so how, how would you personally define a glamour for you? I think it's like, I would say that the, that glamour magic lies on that spectrum for sure. I mean, I wish I could just be like, I'm gonna be blonde today. Like I just do that with wigs, but yeah. I define glamour as um, something that veils what lies beneath it. So, you know, that could be something like clothing, like makeup that you're literally um, veiling your body with something, but it could also be an energy. It could be, you know, um, Matt Orion. I don't know, is that how you pronounce his last name? I don't know, the author. Orin. 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 Matt. Um, That's gonna be like, Fuck you. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Matt, Matt. <laughs> Matt of Psychic Witch, um, of his book Psychic Witch, he has a really cool glamour spell in that where you kind of embody this like specific version of yourself to, you know, like for a job interview or to give a presentation. And I think that the beautiful thing about glamour is that it's not just one thing and it is so personal. Like for me, that means like super hyper feminine stuff. Obviously, you can see I love pink. Um, I love just very loud colors, but Glamour can really be anything from wearing a black leather jacket when you want to feel protected to carving amulets to keep um, bad energies and specific, you know, energies away or wearing talismans that maybe like are heirloom jewelry that you bless and charge for a deity or for yourself. So I really think it's anything that shifts the way that you are perceived and the way that you feel. Um, I, I say that magic transforms you from the inside out and that glamour transforms you from the outside in. Oh, that's um, and that's awesome. when you work with two together, it's just, it's so powerful. And also like, unlike Gardner, unlike probably most, you know, unlike, or unlike him, like most of us are not nudists and most of us don't walk around just naked most of the time. Like, it sounds fun, but um, we wear clothing every day anyway. So glamour is really just an intentional practice of curating how you're seen and how you feel. And there's like such a wide variety of what that looks like. Um, and like, you, you know, I just want to acknowledge like I'm coming from like a very, like that's a, it's a privilege to be able to not only have the time to do that, but to like have the resources to be intentional about what you're wearing. Um, and obviously I'm coming from like a, a, a place of being a cis woman, like, but glamour can really be just like, it can be wearing a pair of underwear that make you feel good. Like people have like their lucky underwear or something like that's That's a glamour. Like you, glamour, even yeah. if you're not charging that uh, pair of underwear, like if you're uh, frequently associating it with a certain thing, like that's glamour. So um, it can really be as, you know, it can be as simple as putting on pink lipstick to channel Venus or painting your nails black. So people like don't fuck with you or green. If you want to draw money, like there's just, I, I think that it's such um, a practical way to weave an intention into our life. And um, I think that's one of the reasons I love it. And it's just, just fun. It's just fun. It's fun. Yeah. Maybe it's in Psychic Witch. I think there probably is. Uh, it might be the shielding thing, but he talks about using different elements, shielding yourself mm. uh, in Psychic Witch. And I love that idea, but you can also do things like you know, a, a bubble of different colors mm-hmm. or different textures or things like that. And I think one of the m- fun things that I used to do as more of a beginner when I was kind of learning how to do energy work like that was that I would go to work and put up a different kind of shield for like, like 
one shield throughout the whole week and then the next week I would do a different kind of shield and kind of see how people would interact with me differently um, and how that would get me perceived differently. So I love that. Yeah, I thought it was it was kind of like a fun little experiment. So, you know, if, if you're beginning or whatever, then try that maybe. Uh, mm-hmm. But it, it, it helped. And then it also gave me some good foundations of which ones gave me more of a protective stance of more of like a, you know, I'm in control and I'm respected compared to I am feared. You know, mm-hmm. there's two very different energies there, but you are still kind of getting a, a blend of a little bit of like protection there. But yeah, just curious type of little uh, magical experience. What's a common misconception that you get with sex magic or glamour magic that you you run across a lot? That's a good question. Um, I really, I feel like people just like, I, I don't really get like a lot of it. I think maybe just when they, like, it's something that I talk about so much, like my audience just kind of like understands what I'm talking about. And I feel like, especially like with COVID stuff, like I've just been like in a bubble, you know, it's like, I can't go out and run into like people who aren't in my sphere of influence per se. Um, But I think it's kind of what you said about like people thinking that glamour magic means you can just like transform something willy nilly um, or that it has to look a certain way maybe that like it's I I really think at least the what I've internalized which I'm sure is just like you know it's internal internalized misogyny that I'm I'm always working through is that like people think that glamour magic is really superficial um, and I don't know if that's something I necessarily get but that's like something I'm always thinking about um, and there's, you know, there's many reasons for that. But like I said, like we're all wearing clothing anyway. And um, I think there's this kind of idea that like anything pretty is like unimportant. And, you know, like obviously things, there's a lot of layers to that. But I do believe that beauty is a really powerful medicine. Um, as far as sex magic, I think it's that you can like, I think it, it it's really the misconceptions I get, I feel like are that you can totally just like change change things really fast, which not to say that doesn't happen, but like you casting, like you using your orgasms to cast a spell isn't gonna like suddenly make somebody like head over heels in love with you and like losing their mind. I mean, maybe it will, but like usually it takes a little bit more prep than just like, you know, that one, that one thing, but I don't know. I don't really like get a lot of misconception questions. Maybe it's cause I just like, don't really check my DMS on Instagram. And if I see somebody being dumb, I just like delete it. But I think people just like, Oh, you know, maybe it's that like you have to practice with a partner for sex magic or that like, it has to be this like really intense, scary thing when it's like, or that you even have to like orgasm. I mean, there are people who can't orgasm and like you can still practice sex magic. So um, yeah, I think that's like, it. I don't really, I haven't really had to deal with too many of those questions, which I guess is good. That is good. I'm glad that you don't have to deal with that. What are your favorite resources for things of sex other than your books and uh, you know, your, your work? Who are some of your inspirations and like your favorite sources of uh, information for things like glamour and sex magic oh that's such a good question i'm actually going to be writing on friday a whole list of like my favorite like sex magic oh perfect on my patreon um so i can plug that and it's just my my username is gabby herstick um uh sophie st thomas is a witch and a sex witch and a writer um, on sex and slub culture and drugs and her book sex witch just came out which is a really great resource such a good book yeah she's it's she's good. really awesome um I really love the the books um, Carnal Alchemy. I don't remember who it's by. But that one's really good. It's like very interesting because it's kind of coming from like a super occult perspective, but still has like that one's more of like BDSM and sex magic, which I like. Um, and then Sacred Kink is another book that's like about that, which I really really enjoyed. Um, oh my god, I'm totally forgetting this guy's name. I don't think it's Ra- not Raven Grimasi. There's another Raven Caldera writes a lot about um paganism and bdsm and he has some really great resources um the wonderful witch woman mystic who wrote the foreword to bewitching elements alexander roxo was a huge resource for me for um sexuality and kink and sacred sex um and she is actually really the reason she's a lot of 
she was the catalyst for my exploration of kink because she wrote or she hosted a, a shibari or erotic rope bondage retreat, um, co-hosted it with Blue from Box Body in San Francisco, and it was like sexual healing and shibari, and it was incredible. And I got suspended for the first time, and um, that really kind of sparked the light under my tuchis, um to explore sex magic and kink, and um, as a part of a magical practice and devotional. Um, and then the wonderful women of the Sex Magic podcast are a fantastic resource. I've been a guest on their show a couple of times, and they're some of my closest friends, but they have a lot of really, really great guests um, and a lot of really powerful resources. Um, Lenore Black is another sex witch who I really love and admire, who has some super powerful um, resources and courses and information about sex magic and super like sex work inclusive. Um, and then I just get a lot of my information from like other sex witches and like sex workers who are practicing sex witches and um, yeah, I feel like, you know, I feel like it's like kind of like the witch world where like when you immerse yourself in the community, you just like, you just find resources. All of these, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it was really my exploration or my um, intro to the world of kink and BDSM felt a lot like witchcraft where like, you like open the door and like, oh my God, there's a whole it's world over, in yeah. here. And you're like, whoa, like, you yeah. know, like I'm still very much a beginner uh, or somebody who's still starting on the path, but it's it's really powerful. And I do think that, you know, like kink too, there's so much ritual in it and there's so much, um, there, it's such like an intentional act. So it really does weave itself well into, into sex magic. You kind of already answered this lightly throughout your questions or your answers already, but what, what are some of the biggest things that you feel people can benefit from practicing sex magic or at least trying or dabbling in sex magic and glamour magic? What are those things that you're like, I really think people can benefit this? Um, I love that you're asking me this because on Saturday at like midnight PST, we have the Virgo full moon and the Vir Virgo is the virgin. And, uh, you know, we have this kind of uh, very problematic idea of virgin and virginity in our society where it's like something that you give away to somebody. But in the ancient past um, in the days of goddess worship, the virgin was a sexually sovereign archetype. It was, you know, the virgin goddesses weren't ch chaste. They weren't, you know, how we consider virgins. They were unwed and they often had these element, these, you know, sacred, the higher duels or sacred prostitutes, women that, and men that would, um, or men that was in at least in like ancient Israel and Jerusalem, but they would share sex with people who wanted to come and worship the goddess. So I have been really inspired by this, by this idea of virginity as being sexually sovereign and as the archetype of Virgo as being like erotically independent. And I really that's think that that's, that's one of the most powerful things that you can learn from sex magic is that your sexuality and your erotic essence isn't defined by who you're with or who you're dating or who you love or how you love that it's something intrinsic to you that you have the right to share however you want or not share however you want um and that it's just such a powerful energy i mean literally sex is life-giving energy it is the energy of creation and there are so many ways to channel it and like when you are able to expand your definition of sex besides just like penetration and are able to see it as anything that brings you pleasure and anything that connects you to like that, that energy within your body, like not only does your sex magic practice grow, but I really do think that like you're able to tap into that kind of like erotic sexual energy in your day-to-day -day life in ways that you wouldn't if you weren't already aware of how the energy was present in your body and present in your life. Um, and then obviously just like a really easy, powerful and fun way to charge spells and workings. I mean, if you're already like masturbating, if you're already having sex, like it really is just like another way to add an element of like, of power to whatever you're doing. And, um, especially like if me, if like you're like me and you work with goddesses of love or goddess of subversion or even gods of love or like, you know, regeneration, then that is such an easy way to like have an offering for the deities that you work with, for the spirits or for yourself. Um, so I, I think it's really multi-tiered. I definitely think that the kind of 
comfort you get in your own body and your own sexual essence is something that's really important, especially with, you know, like the fact that we're still living in a patriarchal world that doesn't want us to be connected to our sexual independence. So um, it can be as deep or as simple as you want. If it's just something to charge a spell, then that's great because it's still powerful, but it can really be a path back to like reclaiming your power that nobody can take away from you. I love that. That's that's a big reason why I love uh, pole dancing and teaching pole dancing. Yeah, that's yeah, so cool. So great. Hold on, you said something that I really liked, and I, I didn't write it down, and I I this, I should have written it down. You, you were saying how you know like practicing sex, sex magic, either masturbating or with someone. There's a lot of mixed conversation and mixed opinions on how that should be practiced. Like, should your partner know? So say you know like say I'm with somebody who doesn't practice and I'm trying to charge something, should I tell them or does that mess it up? Or like, you know, like there's all these different opinions um, on how that should be going about using that with a partner, mm -hmm. especially if somebody, especially with somebody who doesn't practice. So what's your take on that? Um, I think that this is something that like, you're gonna like each practitioner is going to have to have their own set of like ethics and what they believe in. Like what I believe will, probably be different than other people. And I do think that it's important to like have those, you know, even if it's just journaling or internal conversations with yourself to like see what your ethics are. Um, I think that's just like an important thing to do if you're practicing sex magic, any kind of magic. Um, I think that you should at least tell the person because I just believe in consent and like, like active consent. Um, and like, you can be like, hey, like, is it cool? Like, or I just want to let you know, like I'm going to be like, charging this thing like you don't have to tell them like you don't even have to tell them i don't think like what kind of spell it is but like is it okay if i send energy to like a spell i'm working on and then like you know you can see how that goes but i also just like i i think that with sex magic too like you know i don't think it's end of the world if you don't tell somebody i don't think it's end of the world if you practice with sex magic with somebody who like isn't necessarily like you, you love and trust like I've definitely been there but I do think it can get make things more complicated in receiving whatever you're looking for like uh if you practice with somebody that you don't have support and trust like really deep trust with um because you're not you're not going to be able to just like channel that energy and be as open with somebody right. if like you don't have that kind of sense of safety and security. Right. So like, if you're scared, they're gonna judge you uh, about like charging a spell or, or working, then maybe that's like, you should just practice it solo. Um, and like with solo, it's like, you don't have to worry about anybody, not worry about, but like, there's not the extra person to worry about and you can really just be in your in your body. Like most of my, 99% of my sex magic experience has been solo and like, you know, like I have practiced with partners and it was kind of, it was fine. It was like, de definitely made my spell a little bit muddy. Um, but I, I think it really depends on the person. And also like if it's somebody that like you're in a relationship with, I also think that's kind of different, but also like you should, what, don't you want to be honest with that person? Yeah. It's just like anything. I'm like, especially somebody who's like involved with kink. I'm like, I want to like have those conversations of consent before I'm even like fucking you. So right. that should just be involved. But yeah. I, you know, it's up to each practitioner at the end of the day. I think it's similar to, um, you know, conversations around like cheating of kind of like what define, cause other yeah. people, different people define cheating as different things, you know? Exactly. Like, I think as long as you have that open conversation with whoever you're practicing with or with whoever you're sleeping with of like, because you know some people will be like okay well cheating is anything that you hide from your partner yeah. like if you're talking to somebody even if it's not even flirty like if you're talking to somebody and it like yeah. might come off flirty that's cheating whereas other people might not think so it's exactly. like specifically physical interaction so i think you know like that conversation being open with your partner of like hey can i like i practice you know like if sometimes we sleep with each other if i'm sending energy to this thing like, can I do that? Or is that yeah. like, you need me to tell you every time? Can exactly. I do it whenever? You know, like I think having that open conversation is really important, especially if you are uh, sleeping with that person because you really, you kind of are exchanging that energy yep. anyway. So like, yep. you might as well <laughs> have that yeah. conversation um, regardless. So thanks for answering that. Mm -hmm. I thought that's a really interesting question. And like, allowing that to be something that evolves, you know, like you don't just have, it's like with the cheating or it's like monogamy versus being in an open relationship. Like hopefully you're not just having that conversation once and that's the end of it. Hopefully right. it is something that comes up as 
as needed so yeah because things can change people can have different perspective changes and yeah um that yeah that should definitely be an ongoing and open uh thing because i'm i'm sure you know you can be like hey do i need to tell you every time and they're like yeah and i'd like to tell like know what you're sending it to and then eventually they might just be like i don't care you know like it's fine you know so what would you say the best way is for a beginner to kind of start dabbling in this like something that won't be too intimidating won't be too time consuming or like you know overwhelming what where do you think beginners should start if they're interested um honestly i say just like It depends on how comfortable you are with your sexuality. So like if you're not comfortable like masturbating, then taking the time in like a ritual setting. What I mean by that is creating a space where you feel safe, like lighting candles, maybe taking a few moments to meditate or practice your breath, like create the the container, right? Like you wanna make this a, a sacred event. So like doing something to create that kind of liminal space, whether it's calling in the directions or casting a circle or just lighting a candle, saying a solar adoration, whatever it is, like, I think that's just, like, important if, whether you're, you know, masturbating and practicing sex magic or whether you're just, like, exploring your sexuality. So if you're not comfortable masturbating, just, like, taking the time to have a sensual experience with yourself, like, massaging yourself, rubbing a rose on your skin, eating something, like, uh, fruit or chocolate or, like, sipping some aphrodisiac tea and, like, being present to the sensual and sexual energy that comes up as a result of bringing intention to this experience of pleasure um and doing it at a level that feels comfortable because you don't it doesn't have to be like you don't have to dive in right away but i do think that like self-touch um and like self-love and like that kind of physical way can be really powerful but if you are comfortable with that and you do want to dive in just like again set up a space also like making yourself feel beautiful or handsome or just like powerful like putting some cologne on or wearing lipstick doing something where you're like i feel like that witch and like getting yourself into that mindset and then creating a space that is conducive to like this like sexual experience a sensual experience like putting on some like not too distracting music and maybe burning some like rose incense or um you know like dimming the lights and lighting candles like creating a like a physical environment very taurus very venusian that like helps you kind of like cultivate that energy and like figuring out a simple intention even if it's to just get to know your sexuality better um or to connect to your erotic essence and then like masturbating and being present with it and like allowing yourself to just you know you can either think about the intention as you're doing it or wait until you feel like you're gonna climax you're gonna orgasm Um, And then just like sending that energy out into the universe or like sending it throughout your body and feeling it infused into you if you are like wanting to just connect to your sexual essence. Like sex magic is really like, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but like the easiest way to explain it is just using sexual erotic energy for a desired purpose, desired outcome. And that can be obviously manifesting, banishing, um, offerings to deity, but it can also be just connecting to your own erotic power and your own sex sexual um energy within you so like feeling good making a good environment picking out an intention and then just like enjoying the process and raising the energy and just like once you're done just like sitting with it and visualizing what it would feel like to like be embodied in that way or to have that thing you want um whether it's like manifest a lover or manifest like um a better apartment like there's you know infinite numbers of ways to work with sex magic but i really do think that like intention environment um obviously the sexual act itself and then like feeling good are all you know powerful ways to kind of enhance that that practice yeah yeah i was reading uh i don't remember which book it was i'm sure it was in one of my book reviews but um it was uh, sexual magic is the same as creative magic, mm-hmm. you know, because you, like, you, like you said, it is creation. And so um, the energy of creation. So I think uh, that's a big thing that I've noticed that, you know, like you can get, you can get things going or at least mm-hmm. like have, you know, have that, uh, I guess uh, if you do have a foundation already set and you're using sex magic to put it all together, 
it it's very potent like sex, mm-hmm. sex magic is very potent in exactly. creating something so um it's not just i feel like it's it's a little less potent in the changing does that make sense like in a, yeah if you're trying to change a situation compared yeah. to if you're trying to create something or like initiate something right yeah it's a yeah. really powerful catalyst for transformation yeah yeah um, so do you have a favorite like ritual or glamour that you use all the time? Like, is there one that you're like, this is my go-to, I fucking love this one? Honestly, like glamour, uh, uh, cat eye, red or pink lipstick and a collar, my go-to for that. As far as sex magic, um, I mean, I I have like sex toys I really like and like I have, you know, like I'll usually do some kind of meditation, but a lot of, I would say my go-to is kind of different. I really love doing like specific devotionals for different purposes with different goddesses I work with. So like what I mean by that is like doing like 21 days to a certain goddess and like having things I do every day as part of that. And often because I work with goddesses of love, there's an element of love and sex magic. Um, But I would say like one of my favorite rituals is like dressing up and taking photos of myself and like creating and contorting like how i'm seeing not like photoshop contorting contorting is like dressing up and like making yeah. myself look a certain way um but yeah i feel like as far as like one ritual i mean yeah i feel like the sex the sex toys and that is probably like the connecting dots like but as far as like what i'm working with the sex magic for a lot of my sex magic also includes candle magic Um, And it also will often include um, kink as well. So like working with um, like impact play through like uh, spanking myself or a paddle and uh, working with rope bondage and um, honestly also like blood magic and needle play. Like those are all things like I really love to do though. um, It's not something I do like every single day, obviously. So yeah, I hope that answered your question. It did, yeah. And I have one last question yeah. before we end it here on YouTube and then go over to Patreon. Um, what are you doing when you're not being a writer, an author, or a witch? What do you, Ooh, good what do you like question. doing otherwise? <laughs> or is that your whole thing? Is that your whole, you're like, no, this is it. This is for me. Um, honestly, it's really weird because like, it is like a huge part of my life. I mean, if I'm not like reading, okay. I have like a daily practice. So like, that's a big part of my day. And like often if I'm in a devotional, I'll I'll be meditating twice a day. Um, And I like my free time interests definitely intersect with like witchcraft. Like I love reading about goddesses and sex magic and like politics, like sex work and um, you know, like that kind of stuff. Like a lot of my like free time reading is half is mostly research that I just like want to do. Um, lately I have been latch hooking. That's like my favorite craft right now. So it's like making a little rug. A kind little, of okay. Yeah. The little, where you like pull the, the strings through. Yes. It's like, okay. a, you have like a little grid and you just like pull yarn through. It's very simple. I like, I love arts and crafts or like, just like making stuff. Um, I'm, if I'm not like writing or, um, doing something related to like witchcraft, whether it's, you know, something like this, giving an interview, um, doing podcasts, I am either like dressing up and collaging or taking classes of some kind, often which are related to like magic. Um, Lately, I have been watching Mad Men with my roommate at night. So that's our like nightly ritual. It's been really fun. I love taking baths, going on walks, spending time in nature. Um, Edibles are usually involved. Um, and just like, you know, like doing normal stuff. I mean, for me, that means like going and hanging out with my friends at Hollywood Forever Cemetery and like... I love that cemetery. Me God, too. So Are you also in LA? No. Well, so I lived in LA for about five years. Got it. Nice. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. yeah. I was in uh, NoHo for a really long time. Oh, cute. Time. In Studio City. So we were neighbors, we, but we not were neighbors. We were neighbors. Oh, I should have known. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, Hollywood Forever is great. Um, I'm just, you know, like I'm... I love to just like be under the sunshine, like writing, reading, like dancing around. Um, I don't know. There's probably things I'm forgetting, but it magic is really like very woven into my life. So even when I'm not like practicing it, like I'm probably involved with it. Like my latch trick right now, I'm, I'm doing one of uh, the goddess Isis or Aset. So it's like, it's kind of everywhere, which is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you go as hard as most of us do, 
it's really hard not to yeah. have it in everything that you do. And I think that's what like makes like that really to me is like the mark of like a, a witch. Like not to say that like, you know, that's like you have to do these things to be a witch, but like I really think that like when you start seeing your whole life as like a living breathing ritual like when you start seeing magic and witchcraft as like a lens through which you live your life and not just you know something that happens when you do a ritual or spell like that's like that's like when the magic happens it's not just something like you're not just practicing witchcraft when you're like honoring the full moon you're doing it when you're like talking to somebody and listening with your heart or like you know spending time outside under the sun and like communing with a tree like um, or even just like washing your hands. It's really that kind of like intentional lens. I feel like that it, that's why it bleeds into our life. Cause it really does touch everything, even if it's not necessarily like work. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a lifestyle for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and chatting yeah. to everybody and answering my questions for, uh, my YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, thank you for having yeah. me. It was so fun. You are wonderful to have. I'm going to switch you over to my patrons because they have some personal questions. Well, okay. questions that they, they specifically want to know. So, um, yeah, we'll end it here. But thanks to everybody who's watching, and I'll, I'll see you in the next one. And everything that you might want to find her on, I'll link all down below. So uh, go and give her some love. And that was my interview with Gabriella Herstic. I hope that you enjoyed as much as I did. She is a joy to talk to. She's so warm and welcoming. I am so grateful that I finally actually got to get the opportunity to chat with her. Again, everywhere you can find her and her work are down below. That's all there is for this video. I'm Olivia, and as always, thanks for watching. Best of luck, be kind to each other, and may your gods treat you as you've treated others. Bye.